Welcome to GeoInteresting, presented by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. On October 16, 1962, President Kennedy was shown photos that were taken from the high-altitude photographic aircraft, the U-2. After being briefed by analysts who had identified the objects in the photos as medium-range ballistic missiles, President Kennedy convened members of his National Security Council and the Cuban Missile Crisis was triggered. What most people probably don't know is that those analysts were from INPIC, the National Photographic Interpretation Center, a legacy organization to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Today, we're speaking with Jack O'Connor, author of INPIC, Seeing the Secrets and Growing the Leaders. In his book, Mr. O'Connor uncovers the history of INPIC, its employees and its leaders, and its impact on today's geospatial community and practices. Stay tuned for Geo Interesting. Jack, thanks for being with us here today. You're welcome. Um, I guess I'd like to start with what prompted you to write this book? It was something that didn't happen to me very often in my academic career, but I kept thinking, I know more of the answers than I should. <laughs> <laughs> and that had to do with, I would see promotion lists in uh, CIA and other parts of the community, and I thought I knew more names than I should have. And I recognized them from the organization I'd started in, which was NPIC. And so I thought I would write, you know, what was it about that culture of NPIC back in the 80s and earlier that w led to so many folks doing so well? And I thought it would take me six months and be an article. And it took me five years and turned into a book. So the uh, culture of the place was a little harder to, to pin down and took a little more work. But I was never alone in it because once I started asking folks for contributions, I got hundreds of emails. And people who would, would ask if I knew someone or some activity, and if I didn't, they'd introduce me. So I got a huge amount of material and a huge amount of help, which was very gratifying. Because it turned out that organization, um, it was never more than 1,300 people at its largest, but it's produced more than 150 senior executives out of a population that was there in one four-year period. And the people succeeded in um, NGA and its predecessor organization. They went off and succeeded in CIA and in DIA and outside as well. Uh, a number of them went off to form the U.S. commercial satellite business and were instrumental in that. So. So my little challenge of what was it about the place turned into a book. Okay, great. So just spoke a lot about the culture. Um, what made the National Photographic Interpretation Center um, and being at Building 213 at the Navy Yard a special place to work? Two things. Uh, the founder started a culture that uh, really was pretty transparent and uh, built a very positive peer pressure because it was a joint organization and had CIA officers and officers from all the military services and then DIA. And they all worked cooperatively in that there wasn't any rank given to any one person. And in the initial planning, um, this was the organization set up for the U-2, if you've seen the current movie, uh, Bridge of Spies. Mm -hmm. This was the organization that received the product from those missions. And leadership rotated, meaning if the Army guy ran one mission, the Navy guy would go next, Air Force next, CIA next. And it, and it started that in the training even before they overthrew the Soviet Union. So he mm -hmm. wired uh, sharing and cooperation in from the earliest part. And that culture lasted. The second was the challenge of how do we keep preserved knowledge? Because there was too much to write down on the imagery. Mm -hmm. So the way they preserved it was by telling stories and sharing the consensus story and knowing what and listening to the other analysts so that when they would have a discovery, they might say, that looks like something that someone else found, go talk to him. So there was a lot of knowledge sharing in an informal way that was wired in the culture. And because it was in a horrible neighborhood and there wasn't any parking, air conditioning, um, or cafeteria, they all kind of worked very closely together and that built a bond of, we have to solve our own problems because it was so tightly compartmented. So they learned how to build their own tools and mm -hmm. that continued throughout the place. 
Yeah, I did. I did like that about your book. I found it very interesting, both the very closeness of of the analysts and um, also the the kind of competition that was always around. Yes, there was always too much work to do, and then uh, other parts of the community would have theories and. Lots of times, NPIC would bring facts to the table that would blow a hole in the theory, so it wasn't always uh, a benign kind of meeting of the minds. But it always, as an organization, felt it had to earn its place at the table. So the pressure was on, but very junior analysts, if you could make a find or a call, mm -hmm. you could be out uh, leading the community on an issue. And that happened very, very often. So. OK. Um, on page 118, you talk about analytical breadth and depth. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a perennial challenge facing the intelligence business, and have you seen it elsewhere? Um, yes, I have, and it, it is a, an enduring challenge because right now it takes time to develop, as it always did, analytic depth, but now there is so much more information at such a greater rate. and the challenge at uh, NPIC was the folks who predominantly worked at the ground station and did the digital uh, imagery valued breadth, and their old saying was you had to be um, an inch deep and a mile wide, but the folks who were still doing the traditional film return information at Building 213 valued mm -hmm. expertise and deep knowledge on a subject. Both are critical. You can't you can't help the people who are doing current warning without the depth necessary to build indications or to give them, here's what it looked like the last three or four times we saw it, so mm -hmm. this will help you look at the next time. Those relations are both still critical. The, but the challenge now is greater than then, which is um, attention. With so much information, where do I put my attention? Mm -hmm. And so that's what they're developing now. But paradoxically, that was the earliest challenge. We're looking at a country we hadn't seen in 15 years. We know nothing about it. What do we put our attention on? That was the earliest challenge that Lundahl and his people faced flying over the Soviet Union. The last people who looked at parts of it were in World War II. Yeah. So, I often think about that with our younger anal generation of analysts mm -hmm. coming in. Um, because, um, you know, part of the title of your book is Growing the Leaders. Um, how do you think NGA can entice young GEOINT pioneers to join the agency? Or Well, it's uh, one of the things that came up, and I was surprised at how early it came up and I'd noticed, is the criticality of youth and energy. Um, uh, Lundahl's organization when it was made into the National Photographic Interpretation Center, had an average age of 29. Uh, then they hired a lot of new young people for the KH9 programs, and that's the group that really blossomed into the current senior leadership in the intelligence community. But one thing that worked was the challenge. Um, you know, great, good leaders um, you know, lead um, and can influence individuals, but great leaders challenge and focus individuals and they get extraordinary results. And I think Art Lundahl did that and I think Ray Hofstetler did that again. So part of it is hooking the young analyst into the challenge and creating an environment where they can see the difference that they make. And mm -hmm. that was there at, at uh, NPIC. And the... Uh, the message for the young, though, is don't wait to be told. Mm -hmm. Take the initiative, figure out where you can make a difference, and uh, keep learning and build on your, your credibility and your analytic reputation. It's uh, one of the things that you know, senior analysts are made one day at a time, but they uh, have to have the analysts who have the initiative to chase questions. And uh, a lot of this is someone won't ask you the question that really matters, but you may see it in the information yourself and mm -hmm. discern it for yourself. So. Mm -hmm. so you spoke about directors Lundahl and Hofstetler's leadership and influence. What did the directors of NPIC bring to the job 
that was so impactful? I think each director made a, a significant contribution. The, the one that John Hicks made was recognizing that prior to the development of the new digital system, all the measures of how good an image were were subjective and related to the chemistry of photography. Mm -hmm. And he recognized that there needed to be an objective correlative, which was the development of the National Imagery Interpretation Rating Scale. And having had the foresight to see and objectify that allowed people to stop being photo interpreters and start being imagery analysts because they could explain their tradecraft in terms that weren't so related to their tradecraft but were related to intelligence issues. And so that, that was, I think, a, a, an important contribution. And he also recognized that he needed to diversify his workforce. And I think that was critical. The following director, um, uh, Haphazard, but mm -hmm. former General Rutledge Hazard, he recognized that NGA at the time, sorry, um, NPIC at the time, radically needed to develop a digital infrastructure mm -hmm. because they got the digits down from space and they could get them to a very few soft copy workstations because they were a half million dollars each at the time. Mm -hmm. And But he needed to develop an infrastructure for all the analysts, not just a few. And he was... Uh, astute enough politically to realize that he personally would have to go and make the case to Congress and, and get the money. And he made a very successful case. It was the largest line item in the CIA budget for nearly a decade uh, where, where it, was, it happened to be placed. And um, it didn't achieve all its needs, but he had the vision to understand he had to change how the business was done. And, um, and I think that was a, a huge contribution that he had made. So. Tell me what a typical day at in NPIC was like. Well, the uh, a couple of things struck me, and, and many others when I first joined there, is how early it started. The parking lots were pretty full by 6.30 or 7. And part of that was because the imagery came in during the night. Mm -hmm. And the other was the inconvenience of driving all the way down to southeast Washington, and you know, so get in early and then not, not spend as much time stuck in traffic. That was the, the one part. The other was kind of how the when something was going on, things would mesh, and there was always something going on. Uh, for the entire duration of its existence, there was some construction project somewhere else in the building as they had to keep modifying it to get mission done. Mm -hmm. And there was almost always someone in the building. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because of the volume of imagery or because a crisis would necessitate people working extended or long hours. And it, it used to fascinate me on the one day a year when you could bring your family in for the open house, they'd always have to segregate a piece of a vault off because there was a crisis there. So they'd move the displays to the other end of the hall or steer the families away from an area where there mm -hmm. was an active intelligence issue going on. And I think for every year that they had the open house, there was always a crisis. I mean, there was always something going on in the world. Um, I don't know anybody who was there who didn't spend at least one all-nighter uh, or who, wasn't, who doesn't have some crazy story in the middle of the night. And now, um, Director Cardillo, I don't, I'm sure you've heard talks a lot about being transparent and using mm -hmm. commercial um, imagery. Just explaining that right there, did you ever think we'd be at a point to where we're trying to be more transparent as the IC? <laughs> um, initially, no. And I remember kind of one common feature of folks who worked at NPIC was their shock at seeing what they thought was their information appearing in a newspaper or being broadcast on the news. And I remember the phrase we'd use is, we go to jail for that because we took a secrecy oath to not share information and someone would leak it. And now the value to explaining a story of imagery is ubiquitous. Um, you know, grade school kids are proficient in Google Earth. Mm -hmm. And so what was once scarce is now uh, publicly known. 
But the trade craft is not so ubiquitous, and the ability to use different sensors and to um, know how to focus the attention in a way that other folks haven't figured out yet, those are the values that uh, I think NGA has to sustain. Yeah. It can be very transparent, and it can use commercial sources, and the panoply of new commercial sources means that hiding things will become harder, but there will still be people who hide things, and there will still be issues um, where certain countries, uh, Iran or China or Russia, will not want the same degree of transparency as mm -hmm. the United States or the West would like in some issues, and uh, will work very hard to deny us information. And that was going on then, and we learned how to defeat it, and we'll do the same. Okay. Are there any any other personal stories? Uh, well, I tried to keep the personal stories uh, out of my book, mm -hmm. but one interesting fact about that was part of the NPIC culture. Mm -hmm. Many of the stories that I learned were not told to me by the people who actually did the work. The man who got the Chernobyl collection, I shared an office with for a year. I never heard that story. I only heard it secondhand and checked it with him 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And he just didn't, you know, you didn't tell stories about yourself. Other folks would tell the stories about what you could or couldn't do, and, and that was wired in. But it wasn't a culture where self-aggrandizement was, uh, was valued. And, uh, and in the discovery of lots of these things, the multiple number of times when I would ask someone a story about himself and I would be told a story about someone else who did something they thought was more important. That happened more times than I can remember. So it, it really was a, uh, an, interesting and a, uh, an interesting and very effective place at its time. It, it turned out to be a, a great crucible and a great start for folks in the community. Mm -hmm. so. Actually, you've mentioned Chernobyl. Um, would you like to tell that story for those who may not know? Sure. The okay. Initially, um, they got news that there was radiation. And that's all the news there was. It was picked up in Sweden. Um, and in the open source material, you can read it was picked up because someone walked into a nuclear power station and set off the sensors. And they were deathly afraid that someone had walked out. With that they were leaking material, and they thought, where did the radiation come from? They discovered it was outside in the atmosphere. They had no idea where it was. So the question, the, that news got back to the U.S., and then uh, it happened at 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, and uh, by the next day, the Swedes had learned something, and there was something going on, and that was 600 miles away. And then the, uh, we were in a very tight environment for collection, so they had to do lots of planning. But initially, the intelligence community didn't want to take a picture of the power plants. They said, okay, if we think it's this power plant, let's take a picture of the town. Because for 50 years, we've been trying to discover the secret Soviet civil defense plan. And uh, earlier in the book, uh, I wrote Art Lundahl in his very first foreign visit to Konrad Adenauer, the chancellor of West Germany at the time, didn't get to talk about the secrets that we were getting over the Soviet Union because Adenauer had been talking to Khrushchev and they thought well, he might know something about their secret civil defense plan. So it had been an issue for a long time. And the other reason was they thought the U.S. had just had a nuclear accident at Three Mile Island. And they said if we'd have taken a picture of it, we would not have seen anything. So uh, a branch chief at NPIC, Mike Raines, made the case persuasively, along with an image scientist, Tom Wall, that we really do need to take a picture of the power plant, and then persuaded the community um, to uh, overturn the old source analysts and to uh, take the picture. And because the Soviet Union was not so transparent, we knew about Chernobyl nearly at the rate of Gorbachev. Because the news they initially told them is that we had a fire, but it's under control. Mm -hmm. And we were able to see exactly what the damage was and to be able to say when they were, we did see civil defense actually show up as opposed to when they said it showed up. So we were able to present information to our government nearly as fast or faster than, than the Soviet Union. So, And 
it was an initiative on a Sunday afternoon by a GS-14 branch chief. No one told them what to do. It just sort of, we need to get this information. And they started doing research and then calling the experts who were at 213 to find out what they knew and to prepare for you know, what they didn't know what they were going to see because nobody knew what a nuclear reaction, a nuclear explosion would look like. We hadn't seen pictures of it, thankfully. And within a couple of days, we were able to tell the community. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you You're so welcome. much sure. for joining us. You're a wealth of knowledge <laughs> of our tradecraft and our culture, and um, we really appreciate you stopping by and yeah. talking with us. Well, thanks for having me. GeoInteresting is produced by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Never miss an episode of GeoInteresting by subscribing on iTunes or SoundCloud. For more information about NGA, visit us at www.nga.mil. Follow us on Twitter at NGA underscore GeoInt and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening.